Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host Will and today in today's episode I'm joined by Dr Kiko Califat to recap some recent discoveries relating to storm surge extremes and sea level rise. Thanks for joining me today Kiko. It's great to be here, thanks for having me. So should we start off just a bit about your background, so a bit about your career history, maybe well, your journey to NOC and, and how you're in the position you're in today? Yes, yeah, so I am a scientist at the National Ocean Oceanography Centre in Liverpool doing research on a wide range of topics related to the ocean and the climate but really with a focus on sea level extreme weather events and more recently on ocean heat transport uh, but, but let me give you yeah, a fast introduction to how i got here so i didn't set out to become a scientist right. uh, i sort of uh, stumbled into it by chance uh, i graduated with a degree in physics in 2002 um, and after that I had a short stint in a financial firm, working okay. as a financial advisor, <laughs> but I soon realized that that was not the kind of thing I, I wanted to do for the rest of my life, so I quit. And after that, uh, I decided I wanted to become an air traffic controller, okay. but I failed <laughs> because my English was not good enough at right. the time. Um, so at that point, I started feeling a bit uh, directionless, but then, by chance, I ran into an old friend of mine from the university who at the time was doing a PhD in physics actually and he started telling me all about his PhD how great it was how he got to travel across the world things like that of course he didn't mention the less appealing aspects of doing a PhD such as being overworked and underpaid but, but anyway he got me interested and I think it was, it was that same week that I was browsing around the university website uh, and there was an opportunity uh, to do a PhD on sea level. And so I decided to apply. I got the scholarship, started working on it. I immediately felt sort of an enormous intellectual excitement. Right. And I, I liked it. So I decided that was a good place for me to spend my efforts. Um, and after that, I think the progression pathway has been quite typical for a career in academia for me. Right. So I, I got my PhD, then I was for fortunate enough uh, to be awarded a Marie Curie Fellowship, a three-year Marie Curie Fellowship, nice. um, to continue my research on sea yeah. level. Um, first, for the first two years, I was in the US, then I, uh, for the last year, I was actually here in Southampton at, at the NOC. After that, uh, I did a short postdoc, and then finally I moved to a permanent position, which is the position that I currently hold, and right. I'm still doing it, so yeah. I, I obviously like it. Yeah, it's a really interesting <laughs> journey. I think it's the first guest we've had who's nearly an air traffic controller. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> so, should we start on sea level rise then? So, do you want to just give us sort of an introduction to sort of why why we look at sea level rise what's important and, and sort of maybe a bit about sort of how it relates to some extreme weather events like storm surges like you mentioned yeah so okay so early this year so i, I will explain what the storm surge is but yeah. perhaps first allow me to give a little bit of background yeah. um so early this year we published a paper looking at the likelihood of extreme sea level events over the past 60 years in europe Extreme sea level is typically occur during a storm, okay, when high winds and low atmospheric pressure push water onto shore, causing the sea level to rise. Right. And this is what we actually call a storm surge. So those effects from the from the storm is what we call a storm surge. Okay, now extreme sea levels can lead to substantial flooding in coastal areas, uh, and indeed floods related to extreme sea levels cost tens of billions uh, of economic in economic lo uh, losses yeah. globally each year so obviously there is an undeniable need to understand how extreme sea levels work okay and as i said the storm surges are a component of extreme sea levels but not every storm surge leads to extreme sea level event and this is because the likelihood of an extreme sea level event occurring also depends on the phase of the tide, obviously, but also on right. the state of the mean sea level. And by mean sea level, I basically mean the average level of the sea. Right. Um, let's say over a year. Okay. And this is because the storm surge actually form on top of the mean sea level. 
okay yeah. so you can so the mean sea level can be seen as the baseline level for the storm surge okay um and so storm surge that occurs on top of a higher mean sea level will lead to a larger stream sea level event okay um and so we we'll look and so in in this paper we we'll look at how the probability of occurrence of stream sea level events and also storm surges changed over the past 60 years right basically okay so how do, how do we measure these see like the sea level rising extreme sea level events is is there a few different methods or is there um, one that's more effective okay just to be clear what we measure is sea level right not tides or uh, storm surges yeah. or mean sea level yeah. separately but we can actually separate them from the sea level records that are available to us right. but what we measure is sea level right okay and there are basically two instruments that we use to measure sea level in general and the first one is what we call a tide gauge so this is an instrument that uh, we use to measure sea level here on the ground okay and the other type of instrument that we use is uh, satellite uh, altimeters basically yeah. that measure sea level from space basically right uh, but there are differences between these two types of measurements the most important one when you're thinking about um string sea levels is the fact that tide gauges provide data at a very high frequency they sample the ocean at a very high frequency uh, so some of the most some of the modern tide gauges actually give you um give you data at a frequency better than one minute and you really need uh, high frequency data to be able to analyze string sea levels so for the analysis of string sea levels we use data from tide gauges not from altimetry mainly right um, so they are they all over the world like they all over the world are they to be look at do we look at ones yeah, that's one of the other differences yeah. between tide gauges and altimetry yeah. so tide gauges are located on well at the coast yeah and because tide gauges have been around much long for much longer than altimetry so um, they provide in some cases some long well long records of sea level okay uh some of them actually go back to the 1700s yeah okay uh altimetry provides better spatial coverage uh but only since 1992 right and also as i said the temporal sampling is not really suitable to do uh stream value analysis so they're fairly modern then <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah yeah it's fa fairly modern yeah yes. so you, you mentioned that the so sort of back in march <clears throat> last year you did the paper about the storm sort of looking at storm surge extremes yes. what what were the findings of the paper then were they were they, were they what you expected to find or were they um okay so so let me tell you something first so the so how can i say this the subject of understanding how climate change relates to the occurrences of storm surge extremes is that i would say is at the cutting edge of um sea level research right so there are no settled questions that people agree on there are inconsistencies uh, between the studies and things like that okay but most studies uh, on storm storm surge extremes emphasize that changes in storm surge streams over time and by changes in storm surge streams i mean changes in the occurrence probability of those events are not statistically significant right many studies actually have concluded this um that the changes are not statistically significant um and this is often interpreted as to mean that there are no changes in storm surge streams and actually this is the story that's been told also uh, in the IPCC reports, right. okay, but actually this is a misinterpretation of <laughs> of what we call a statistical significance because <clears throat> the fact that a change or a trend is not a statistical significant doesn't mean that there is no a trend or that the trend is a small or absent. Right. In the same sense that absence of uh, evidence is not evidence of absence. Okay. And this is what we pointed out in our study, basically. Um, <clears throat> so what we found um, is that uh, storm surge streams have become 
much more likely in certain parts of Europe, particularly in northern parts of the British Isles, and less likely uh, south of these latitudes, so in well parts of Europe from Portugal to Germany, right. actually. Uh, they have actually become less likely over okay. the past 60 years. Just to give you, just to give you some numbers, uh, what used to be a 50-year event, storm surge event, yeah. in 1960, is now a 30-year event. Yeah. So that's, a, so that's an increase, a 40% a increase yeah. in the probability of occurrence right. of storm surge uh, event. So that's quite a big increase over, I guess, what is relatively <laughs> a relatively short amount of time, I guess. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. It's it's yeah it's such a it's such a, a big change yes yeah and the thing is that these changes are comparable to the effects of sea level rise right okay so just to, just to clarify something so the likelihood of extreme sea level events can change because of two factors F the first one is changes in storminess affecting the occurrences of storm surges the second one is changes in mean sea level such as sea level rise yeah. Uh, this will change the the baseline level for the storm surges, uh, and so it has an effect on the likelihood of extreme sea level events. Okay, and before our study, the picture that was being painted is that only sea level rise actually was affecting the likelihood of extreme sea level events, while a storm surge events were actually stationary; they weren't changing. That's the story that uh, was being told. And that has important implications because uh, adaptation policy actually is informed by climate science. And in most countries, current policy for assessing future coastal flood risk assumes that the probability of storm surges is the same now as in the future. Right. So they assume that they won't change in the future. Um, and of course, should this turn out to be wrong, then it may, you know, cause the adaptation plans to become ineffective. And what we showed in our paper is that this assumption is actually wrong, is false, uh, and storm surge events are changing at similar rates uh, to the sea level rise yeah. uh, at many locations. This uh, is a very important discovery then, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so our results were contrary to the prevailing view, yeah. uh, basically. So did the study... Did the study sort of show that in the future it's likely to, to carry on in that trend or will we not know that until? So I don't have the right answer to that question, yeah. but what I can say, roughly speaking, is that so the changes that we found in, in storm surge streams were mostly driven by what we call internal climate variability. Right. Internal climate variability is variability that is due to the internal dynamics of the climate system uh, without any external forcing. So this is not what we, be, we would call due to climate change. It's not, not related. Right. And there is a part that is related to climate change. Now, internal climate variability can change over time. So those are, by definition, uh, say, fluctuating uh, changes. Okay. So the changes that we reported might not continue into the future. Right. But there is a part of these changes that is actually driven by climate change, and yeah. anthropogenic forcing, and those changes are likely to continue into the future. So it's like, yeah. With this part, yes. Yeah. So yes, some of the changes will continue right. into, into the future. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, <clears throat> so the, the reason why we were we were able to detect those changes in storm surge streams while other or other past studies couldn't is because it is very challenging to estimate those changes from die gauge records, basically because um, traditional approaches to estimating streams are subject to something that we call sampling error. By this, I mean that the changes, the long-term changes that you are trying to measure are to orders of magnitude smaller than the year-to-year -year variations in streams. Right. So this actually introduces a lot of sampling error in your train estimates. And traditional approaches are particularly sensitive to those uh, complications. We were able to address those complications by uh, developing a new methods called Bayesian methods, which allowed us to 
combine all the data from die gauge data and enable sharing on if, of information across data sets. When you do that, you kind of minimize the, the effect of uh, sampling error on your return estimates. Is that accuracy then? It's yes, so your estimates of long term changes yeah. are much more precise. Right. Um, okay. And you can detect changes that are smaller uh, than you could actually detect using traditional approaches. Right, that's really interesting. So later on in later on last year, so you you made a pretty discover pretty significant discovery in the Mediterranean relating to sea rise. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that about that study? <laughs> yes. Um okay, let me okay. So before I dive into this particular yeah. study, yeah, again, let me share some thoughts as to why understanding regional sea level is, is very important. Yeah. Um, so usually when you hear people talking about sea level rise on the news, for instance, uh, they are usually talking about global average sea level. Not always, but right. usually. Uh, but the thing is that global average sea level rise is not a very good measure of local sea level. And this is because sea level rise is highly non-uniform in space. Uh, so it's very different at different locations. And so it is very important to understand how this works, how uh, local sea level works and understand the main drivers of yeah. uh, local sea level variability. And this is what we did in that particular study uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. So the focus was the Mediterranean Sea. Um, now the problem of uh, trying to understand local sea level is that, as I said, Tide gauges give you long records of sea level, but only at a few locations along the coastline. And tide gauges and satellite altimetry gives you actually better spatial coverage, but only since 1992. Right. And you actually want to know what happened before 1992 in other locations in the deep yeah. ocean, but also at coastal locations that are engaged, not uh, observed. Yeah. Um, and so what we did is we collected tide gauge data, altimetry data, and we combined them using well statistical methods that also included what we call patterns of responses to land ice melting. So by doing this, we were able not only to reconstruct past sea level changes, but also to quantify the contribution from land ice melting and also well ocean heat uptake thermal expansion yeah. and separate those changes. That's the novelty in our study. Um, it's, it's this capability of separating the source contributions to, yeah. to the sea level change regionally in the Mediterranean Sea. And, and yes, and wh what we found is that in the Mediterranean Sea, um, sea level rise has accelerated significantly over the past 20 years. Um, so it's actually rising probably at a rate that is twice as large as the rate uh, prior to right. uh, those years. Um, so a, so significant, a long... significant increase. Yes. But we also found that there is a lot of regional variability in terms of the uh, rate of sea level rise within the Mediterranean basin. So again, some regions are uh, there are some regions where sea level is actually rising much faster yeah. than the the average. Yeah, so um, I guess that ties in with the thing that defines you have the storm surges that both are rising at the same time. It's <laughs> yes, well, that again. So storm surges and sea level rise means sea level rise have yeah. two components, two yeah. factors that affect the likelihood of extreme sea level events. Yeah. Both of them separately affect those yeah. likelihoods. So it's very important to understand both components yeah. um, of the system. Yeah. And so the first study addressed the storm surges, the second study addressed uh, sea level rise, basically, regionally in the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah. So yes, so where you have sea level rise, and on top of that, if, uh, you have an increase in the likelihood of storm surge events. This obviously will lead to a significant increase in the likelihood of extreme sea levels. Right. Okay. So what? So what? What can we do, and what are the sort of solutions we can do to mitigate the effects of these extreme sea level <laughs> events when they happen, if they happen? What can we do, sort of either locally okay. or internationally, that can sort of mitigate those effects? Um. So okay. So so I, I'm not a coastal planner, so yeah. I don't know exactly how uh, coastal adaptation should be designed and implemented. Right. Um. 
But my rough, I my, my rough idea for what this was is that so adaptation plans should focus on basically measures of protection that aim to balance uh, protection costs with the consequences of a hazard, so right. a storm surge event, where it to happen. Because this can sell. So I think a well-designed uh, risk mitigation strategy can save both lives, but also money yeah. um, by reducing disaster impact, while at the same time avoiding, well, needless and expensive overprotection measures. Um, so I, I don't know if that answered your question, but I think it's all I can come up with for yeah. an answer. Um, yeah, it seems like I guess a logical <laughs> thing. That, yeah. So what, what's, ne what's next for you then? Are there any particular sort of exciting projects you're working on at the moment? Yeah, there are. There are a few, yes. So, so let me tell you something. So most of my research for a large part of my career has focused on sea level. Yeah. That's most of it. But lately... I feel it's just become harder and harder for me to figure out new interesting ideas <laughs> uh, in sea level. And yeah. this has caused me to shift research interests. Right. Or rather, no, not shift research interests, rather branch out from sea level into other areas of research. Right. Um, and so one project that uh, I am very excited about is called the EPOC project. Uh, this is a European project funded through the, well, the Horizon Europe uh, right. program. Right. Uh, EPOC stands for explaining and predicting the ocean conveyor. Right. And by ocean conveyor, I mean the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Right. Which is a large system of currents that um, carry warm water from the tropics into the North Atlantic, and it is it is largely uh, responsible for the mild weather climate right. that we enjoy in Europe. And so the, go the goal of the project is to basically understand the role of the overturning circulation in the well more general context of the Earth climate system and its impacts on the weather, basically. Yeah, so do you think you work in sea level and that will aid you in, in carrying out that and working <laughs> so on I'm that project? So I'm still very much active in, right. in sea level. Right. Uh, and this project actually involves a sea level component as right. well because we are looking at ocean heat transport uh, right. across the Atlantic Ocean based on sea level observations uh, among other types yeah, of observations. So compl complements yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. nicely. So, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, thank you for joining us today, Kiko. Follow the links in the description to learn more about Kiko's recent papers or visit our under the surface pages to learn out more about sea level rise. If you haven't already, make sure to follow us on social media to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes. See you in the next episode.